Welcome to yet another Center for Causal Discovery. Oh, that's that's good. I'll speak softer. Another Center for Causal Discovery Distinguished Lecture Series. It's a great pleasure uh, for us to have Ricardo Silva come visit us. He was um, a PhD student in the causal group in philosophy at Pitt, and I was lucky enough to be one of his co-advisors. Uh, and he was one of the first PhDs um, in machine learning uh, at Carnegie Mellon, and you graduated in 2005. So, uh, so exciting. So, um, Ricardo is now the senior lecturer, a senior lecturer, uh, in the Department of Statistical Science uh, and an adjunct faculty member in the Gatsby Computational Neuroscience Unit and in the management group of the Center for Computational Statistics and Machine Learning at University College London. So um, he's done incredibly well. But my recollections of him uh, when he was a student, um, I had two students at that time, and one of them was uh, quite different. I would give uh, you know, all sorts of um, discussion and advice, and, and we'd agree on something like, you, know, you did it for continuous variables, how about for discrete? And uh, uh, he'd come in next week having done almost nothing and say, well, I thought you wanted me to be discreet about it. <laughs> and Ricardo, on the other hand, uh, we would talk in the morning and I'd recommend a, a couple of papers that he might go take a look at. And then by about two in the afternoon, uh, I'd get email or a phone call saying he'd read the papers and he had a question, uh, which I realized I could not answer because the question was so incredibly pointed and deep. So um, it was very, very quick that Ricardo acted a lot more like a colleague than a student. And it was a great pleasure supervising him and working with him, and uh, uh, it's a great pleasure to have him here today. Well, I'm just first thank everybody for coming here today and for the invitation. It's a great pleasure to be back here. I think the last time I was in Pittsburgh was almost 10 years ago. I was quite surprised when I got in the city and I saw this very new and shiny, bright cathedral of learning. But the last time I was here, I remember, is still having the signs of old Pittsburgh in it. Okay, so the talk today is in collaboration with a couple of colleagues. So I'd like first to thank them to um, help me with this project. So one colleague of mine, Robin Evans in Oxford, in the complete opposite side of the world, uh, Shohei Shimizu, who's uh, now in Osaka. So the general idea here, the scope of the, pro the methods I'm going to describe is very specific. So I'm assuming here that I have a given treatment, a given outcome. You can call them X and Y. And all I'm interested here is to learn the cause effect of X and Y. This actually quantitative uh, measure on how Y will change when you intervene on X. So I'm going to make lots of assumptions here much about the causal structure be assumed a priori, but there's still lots of other problems that you need to cope and where causal discovery will play a role. So assuming you are given this directionality between X and Y, and are gonna have a set of covariates, which I also know something about the causal order of them. I'm gonna assume that this other set of covariates I have also precede the X and Y. So this is the whole setup. Just, me, just give me the cause effect of X and Y under these conditions. Now, to achieve that, I employ some variations of the fitness assumptions and different as also for the assumptions on which kind of parametric model might have um, underlying this structure. So more specifically, I'll cover two main cases, a case where the whole model is linear. Then I'll try to see what's this linear effect on X and Y. You have a discrete case where the effects can be nonlinear between X and Y. And to be simpler, I'm going to focus on the binary case. So this is the whole outline here. There'll be two main parts on it. Okay. Now, there'll be some take home messages here. And I'll go ahead and the title of the talk, as you can see, there's something that is going to be intermediate ways of combining ideas from backdoor adjustments and instrumental variables adjustments. And if you don't, you're not very familiar with them, I'm going to review them very quickly at the beginning. So it's not very common to combine these two ways of adjusting for cause effects and I show how they'll be able to um, be used together within the context of causal discovery. Okay? Now, there'll be some discussion points which I'm actually not going to talk about here in this talk. This is some sort of things that you might think while I present some of the methods here, which might bring some interesting future work I'm interested in continuing based on the results I have in this presentation. 
So for example, one thing I'm not going to talk about is, a, is sensitivity analysis. It's also already part in a paper that is based on the results I have here, but I'm not going to talk about it. But while I presented the points, you might already thinking, might be thinking on how this could be related to sensitivity analysis. And this afternoon, I'll be very happy to discuss that if whoever is interested. Okay? So please feel free to interrupt me at any moment. Now, quick background to make sure everybody's on the same page. So I want to estimate this cause effects on X and Y. So this is a simple diagram of a situation I might be interested in where I would intervene on smoking. So a rectangle here means a very which being intervened upon. So this breaks these links. I'm interested in this distribution of the outcome given treatment if my regime behave like that. But what I'm going to have in practice here is observational data. So my data comes from a regime that factorizes according to that. So to distinguish among them, I'm going to use the, um, the usual notation from Perl. This dual operator that indexes among different regimes, right? So what I'm interested in here is this, this distribution of this outcome given an intervention treatment. So this notation distinguishes it from the natural regime. They need assumptions linking them together. Essentially, these are the usual invariance assumptions that you have on causal graphical models. So if I intervene here, uh, the other condition distributions in the remaining variables remain varied. Okay? And the observational data it might be able to learn what these condition distributions are. That's how I link these regimes. Now, if you have this setup where you have this partial causal ordering, I'm not interested in reconstructing a full graph that's from which I could read uh, this intervention distribution. I'm going to focus on whatever is the least I need in order to find this condition distribution. Okay. So the two main tricks I'm being based on is the backdoor adjustment instrument of variables. So if you're not familiar with backdoor adjustment is, this is a very quick review. So I have variables which block confounding between treatment and outcome. So if I want to this condition distribution under intervention, uh, I need this quantity. So using the invariant assumptions that I have from the definition of causal graphical model, I can introduce and marginalize this extra covariate Z. And under invariance, I can transform some of these quantities into something that can be identified from observational data. Okay, this is the standard trick in the vast majority of applications you see on how to estimate cause effects uh, given observational data in these assumptions. Right? So, of course, when I say that these variables that can be used to block confound, they don't need to be hidden common causes, just block hidden common causes between treatment and outcome. Right? The second main trick is this instrument of variables. Again, many of you might be familiar with this, but it's just put everybody on the same page. So this is an important way when you cannot block a measure confounding. So backdoor adjustments cannot be used in that case. But you might have some sort of auxiliary variable that works sort of as a surrogate experiment. So it, it, in an informal way, I would say it, it's a cause only of the a direct cause only of the treatment that you're interested in. So you could have in the medical literature, for example, these designs where somebody is given encouragement to take a vaccination or not, and you could randomize that but not vaccination. So this variable would be exhaustion here would be an instrumental variable for this relationship between taking vaccination whether or not you get hospitalized later. Okay? So this is, val is valuable when you really cannot identify which hidden common causes you need to block. There are many ways you can exploit that, including situations where a variable might be instrumental only if you condition some auxiliary covariates. So here, this is a classical instrumental variable setup without these other connections. Uh, if you have directed paths between the instrument and the outcome, but you might still be able to block um, given some other variables you measure. So you might have also conditional instrumental variables. Okay, and by the end of the day, the way that it can be used is to constrain the possible distributions between Y and uh, treatment X, which is intervened upon. So under these constraints, you might be able to bound the cause effect. And sometimes with further parametric constraints, you might actually achieve point identification of the cause effect on X and Y. Right? Everybody happy? 
Now the two main parts. <laughs> Please interrupt me at any point. So Sometimes. <laughs> oh, this is a loaded question, I know. I shouldn't ask something like that. <laughs> so the first part is about the linear case. I'm going to assume a particular parametric form or the causal model generated the data. Okay. So it's essentially what people call a linear structure equation model. So if you have, in this case, a cyclic model, so that's some acyclicity here, uh, you can parameterize this model by just having for every variable in it a structure equation saying that this variable is given by a linear combination of its parents plus some additive noise. Okay? And I set up. I'm defined that my goal here is to find a cause effect of some x on some y. So this will correspond to a parameter in the structure equation for y. So there'll be a parameter there linking x to y, among other structural coefficients on the other parents of y. The cause effect I'm interested in here is just this coefficient, the structure equation for y. Now, there are different ways by which you might be able to identify that coefficient. So you might not be able to say, to, might not be able to know what the causal structure is, but you might be able to find just enough information to know what could be a set that would block backdoor paths between x and y among the variables that you do measure. So if you measure some variable z, which might be a variable that satisfies the backdoor condition for x and y, but you don't know that, you might use some causal discovery methods to identify it. So one very direct way of doing it is by exploiting non-Gaussian assumptions. This is some previous work by Doris Antonet, Patrick Hoy, and Peter Spertz on how under the assumptions of non-Gaussianity, you'd be able to find whether or not uh, some set might satisfy the backdoor condition. So the idea there uh, might not look very intuitive, but I'll try my best to explain more or less how it works. Is if you regress this outcome y on the remaining variables and look at the residual, so this is just a notation for least squares projection. So by regression means, I mean least squares regression. So you've got the residual of these least square regressions for y, given these variables, and for x, even z, and you test on whether or not they are independent. Okay, they'll be uncorrelated by construction, but if it's non-Gaussian errors, they might or not be independent. And one intuition behind this is, uh, if this variable z is really blocking the backdoor paths, this residual will not be a function of any hidden common cause of x and y. So they'll be independent that case. So if they don't condition on z, uh, this residual be just a, uh, equal to x will be a function of u. So this residual of y will also be a function of u. So they would be dependent. And this is how would you falsify z as not a plausible set that can block the backdoors. Okay? Well, of course, this works only if such a set z exists. If it doesn't, there's nothing you can say according to this criteria. So it cannot identify the cause effect of it by this backdoor adjustment. So that's when you might try to rely upon the other big trick with using instrumental variables, which allow you to estimate this effect even under measure confounding, if you do have an instrument. Now, it's not clear what you do from a structural learning perspective uh, on try to find instrumental variables directly. Remember, the goal here is that you have this particular cause effect you want to estimate. You don't want to reconstruct the full graph. You want to estimate this particular cause effect. And the game here is trying to do this the most direct way possible. So if I want to find instruments, well, let's just look at what <coughs> structural signatures will give me instruments. So one way by which you can try to find instruments is see what implications they have in the observed distribution. So I, I say this tongue in cheek that the rule that you find here is the whole basis of econometrics. It's a bit of an exaggeration, but it's that, that much of an exaggeration. <laughs> <laughs> so the implications that you might have in the joint distribution will follow from this idea on how would you identify 
cause effects in a linear system with an instrumental variable. So I, I hope you can see it well. Um, you can write essentially the observable covariance as functions of these structural parameters. So the covariance between y and w, the covariance between x and w, there'll be function of these structural parameters. Is this is just three lines of algebra to show that the, the causal coefficient are interested in can be given by the ratio of these two covariances, which you can estimate them from observational data. This does imply any constraint on the joint covariance of W, X, and Y, so there is no testable way from the covariance of W, X, and Y to show that W is indeed an instrument. But from there, you can try to find over-identification conditions which will imply constraints in the covariance of the observed variables. So if you have more than one instrument, that's when things will start getting constrained. That's when you can start finding the structural <coughs> signatures of these instruments. So to make sure uh, things are a bit more uh, concrete, I'm going to basically describe the different steps that are done by some examples. Um, so I'm going to tell you in advance, this is not going to be an easy test. But at the end of the day, whatever methods I describe here, they'll not be able in general to find the cause effect. But they might provide a set of candidates. So in one sense, it's a type of equivalence class of cause effects instead of equivalence class <coughs> of graphs. Okay? And there are ways by which you can use this to actually make some useful claims sometimes about what the cause effect should be. So in, if I'm interested in describing how structure can be derived from constraints, it's useful to give a graphical characterization. What do I mean by the constraints I'm going to use when search um, for identifiers of the cause effect? So this, this is general definition, what an instrumental variable means in terms of a graphical criteria. This is not my idea, of course. This is well known in the literature. There are generalizations of it, which I'm not going to talk about. I'm going to use this as the uh, type of structural signature I'd like to find from constraints in the observable distribution. So graphically, you can say that W is instrumental variable condition on some covariance Z for the causal relation between X and Y if it satisfies these three criteria. So you want W and X to remain dependent even condition on these covariance. You can see the motivation for this because in this um, equation, I need to have a non-zero correlation between my instrument and my treatment. So I need to guarantee that even after condition on the possible auxiliary variables, there's still going to be a non-zero correlation. Okay? So the second condition is the most complex one. We want Z to de-separate W from Y. In the graph, we remove this edge between X and Y. So another way of understanding it is essentially saying all directed paths, all paths that are into Y starting from W have to pass through X, or the active paths from W into Y have to pass through X. Okay, so if I remove this edge, there'll be nothing left. Everything else is blocked uh, by Z's. Okay, and the third condition is Z are non descendants of X and Y. This is a bit more technical one. But the point I want to make is um, condition one is easy to test. This is, you can use the usual faithfulness assumptions to test this. And condition three is true by my assumption. I already assumed this partial ordering. So the only thing I need to worry about is condition two here. How to find from constraints in the distribution something that justifies criteria two. OK? So as I mentioned, over identification is one way by which you can start getting some um, testable conditions. So if you have two variables which are instruments, they have to imply the same cause effect. Right? And if you can use the two estimators on these two ratios that identify cause effect, these two ratios have to be the same. This will give you a demo constraint, the covariances of your joint distribution. So this is sometimes known as a tetrad constraint because it implies it uses four different variables in defining a particular relationship that is not general. You cannot find this in any covariance matrix. Okay. Now, this is a necessary, but it's not a sufficient condition to 
find instruments. So this is a different graph uh, using the same labels for the variables. And this graph will also imply this tetrad constraint. Okay, even though W1 and W2, there are neither instruments for X, Y. If you try to use these ratios to estimate the cause effect, they can be widely different from the actual uh, lambda yx. Okay, so you cannot just use this to be able to say something is an instrument. But the idea here is to reduce the set of possibilities, and you want to understand what, in which conditions, uh, which graphical structures are compatible with instruments, which ones are not based on signatures like that. Now, you will need, by the end of the day, some further assumptions on how to reduce the set of possibilities since the tetrad constraints by themselves are not enough. Now, there will be some, there is some growing work in the literature there on which extra assumptions you can throw into your algorithm in order to reduce or even identify what the cause effect is based on these constraints. So I don't know if anybody here is familiar with this recent work that was uh, out in JASA recently uh, for a group of people in Wharton, where they start assuming that there is a set of valid IVs and a set of invalid IVs. And they assume something about the proportion of which variables are valid compared to the total number of possible candidate IVs. So we start with a set of covariates you have a treatment X, you have the outcome Y, you make some assumption there about the proportion of these covariates, which are actual instruments conditioning on the remaining variables. So here we would have that Z3 and Z4 are not valid instruments because they have these direct connections, but Z1 and Z2 are valid instruments conditioning on the two other guys. Okay, but you don't know which is which. So if you assume that more than half of this pre of this set of covariates that are given is valid, then you can show you can identify that which ones are valid and then get the correct cause effect. Now, one way of understanding what is meant by that is by this simple algorithm. It's not the algorithm which was in the JASA paper, it's a simplified version of it. I'm using this symbol here, infinite, just to mention that this is on the population covariance matrix, okay? There, is, there are no statistical tests here, it's just one algorithm for identifying cause effects to make the presentation simpler. So to understand how those assumptions work, well, it's just a matter of going through, sorry, I used Z before, but what I mean by V here is the same as the set Z you saw before. One way of understanding how this majority rule is useful is looking for every element in the set and calculating uh, the ratio of covariances condition everybody else. This gives you some, S, some coefficient beta. For every single variable, there will be one particular beta correspond to one particular ratio. Okay? So if more than half of these variables are valid IVs, there will be more than half of these betas being equal to each other. There's only one possible way of this being true. So when you see the majority among this set here uh, achieving the same value, then that has to be the cause effect for X and Y. Okay? And there are sample versions of that that use empirical covariance matrices. Now, this is, of course, can be a very strong assumption. And also, conditioning might make your life harder instead of easier. So this is not totally straightforward to see from the graph, but if you condition on this variable, which creates this active path here, there will be still a, a condition tetrad constraint holding between W, X, and Y condition on Z, even though this is not a valid instrument of variable condition on Z. And essentially here is saying, 100 out of 101 variables are invalid, and yet, if you didn't condition on Z, the vast majority of this would be valid. So conditioning also matters here, because conditioning might still create a drug constraints, but they might give you something that is not an instrumental variable. 
Okay. Now, one way that you try, one way to not use this assumption that more than half of the variables are valid is just literally try to enumerate different ways by which tetrad constraints can arise in your covariance matrix. Now, this algorithm here, which I'm calling tetrad IV, but I guess I should change the name because it looks like tetrad 4. <laughs> so maybe I should just exchange the IV with tetrad. So let's call that IV tetrad instead. This algorithm is conceptually very simple. Uh, this looks much complicated than the other one, but essentially all it does is to look for every pair of variables, some conditioning set in which you'll find that the tetrad constraint holds and then add that to a set of possible cause effects. Okay, this is all it does. That's why it gives you a set like this. Now, what you might want to know is to characterize when things can go wrong. Well, this is going to be the outcome of the outcome. It's just this set there. You might try to understand when the result is correct, when the result is wrong, and provide causal graphical explanations for that. Okay, so what do I mean by it? Um, basically, you might want to explain if I have this tetrad constraint, which structures are compatible with it. So if you have an unconditional tetrad constraint, just the covariances between instruments and treatment, instruments and outcomes and those particular ratios, this is unconditional because not conditioning any auxiliary variable z. In this situation, there is already a well-known graphical characterization of what that means. So some work done by those guys here in what, early 90s or even earlier than that? In the 80s. Yes, yeah, so it might be in that chapter in causation prediction such that nobody reads, that the one that has a complicated proof what graphical structures are compatible with a tetrad constraint. So the, I'm using scare quotes in, in a few slides here just because I'm not going to give a formal definition. I'm just going to show informally what these concepts mean. So if you have tetrad, there will be some sort of corresponding choke point. And one way of understanding this is just some variable that is in between tracks of one set, connecting one set and another set. So if you're not familiar what I mean by track, just imagine it's a path that has no colliders. Okay, you might have a common cause path or a directed path. Okay? So if you have here this set W1, W2, and this set X and Y, there will be that tetrad constraint I mentioned to you before. And the way it emerges out of a graph is the fact that there is this choke point, which is X in this case, intermediating all tracks between this set W1, W2, and this set X and Y. Okay? Notice this graph, which I used before, which doesn't give you IVs. The choke point could be uh, U1, for example. So the choke point here is not X. That's where things go wrong. But the choke point is not X in this graph. Now, this is well known. What, is not well, what wasn't well known is what happens under conditional tetrad constraints, which kind of characterizations you can give to that. So, in a conditional tetrad constraint, you cannot just borrow the re tetrad representation theorem directly, because when you condition in a set, you might not have a DAG anymore. And the original theorem was for DAG structures, and conditioning will, might give you an object which is not a DAG. Okay? But there are ways of uh, reinterpreting some, some recent work on constraints in co of covariance matrices in terms of conditional tetrad constraints. So this is a result um, from a already six-year-old paper. I cannot believe that. By Sullivan et al. That was the end of self statistics in 2010 that tries to generalize the tetrad representation theorem. So suppose you have a structure like this. I think Chris Brooks likes to call this a spider graph. <laughs> uh, so in a model like this, uh, you might have a notion called T separation, just to make things more complicated. So again, the scare quotes here means, I'm not going to define this precisely, <laughs> but the main idea here is you have something that some 
nodes, a set of nodes that key separates other sets of nodes. So what does this complicated detour tell me? Well, if you look at this variable here, vi1, this variable there, vj2, if you condition this guy v0, you're going to activate something and condition on v0, this is not going to be d separated or this is common collider. But this is not a track. So this is wouldn't this wouldn't count for t separation. So if you look at the tracks between this guy and that guy, so all of them will have v naught at some point intercepting the track. So that's what t separation is. Okay. I can generalize this notion for sets that t separate other sets. So in this case, here's just one variable v naught, which t separates vi1, vi2, and itself from vj1, vj2, and itself. Okay? Every track between this set and this set is intermediated by v0. Okay? The good, the interesting thing about this fact is it doesn't make use of these two variables v1 and v2. So if those were hidden variables, would we still be able to detect this t separation? Because this has an implication on the rank of the cross covariance matrix between this set and that set. So if you, if you, if you write down the algebraic expression for the cross covariance matrix between the VI1, VI2, V0 set, and VJ1, VJ2, V0 set, you can show that the rank, this matrix will be rank deficient, so the determinant is zero, for example. And this is a test for implication of this cross covariance matrix. Okay. Now, how is this related to conditional tetrad constraints? It's actually very straightforward. Uh, if you look at the possibility of t separating this set here of two possible candidate IVs and the treatment outcome x, y, uh, if there is a t separation implied by z, this determinant will drop rank, so be zero. This covariance measure drop rank, so be zero. But for sure, by Schultz complement, you can write the determinant as the determinant of the covariance of disease and the tetrad. So this tetrad here will hold. This identity will be zero if and only if this determinant is zero. Okay. So this this is a graphical characterization of what the condition of tetrad constraint would be. Okay. So this is a way of explaining why you don't might not satisfy criterion two from the graphical characterization of an instrumental variable. Because here, this condition might not still be true because we might have some latent variable that is part of this choke set. Okay, just like here, you have a latent variable which was the choke point for this unconditioned tetrad. You might have on top of Z, some extra variable which with Z will form the choke set. So this explains situations where if the result you get is wrong, it is because there's some extra variable that is part of the choke set. And this, the number of uh, wrong solutions might get me, might actually increase linearly the number of variables we have. Mm -hmm. So this is a very worst case scenario that I have here. All the U variables we have there are latent variables. All the W variables are candidate IVs. Okay, so if I pick, for example, these two variables, W2A and W2B, I pick all the remaining W variables as my conditioning set. Okay, this conditioning set will imply a conditional tetrad constraint between W2 and X and Y. But the choke set will also include this annoying little guy, U2. And this will violate that condition of instrument of very requiring independence between the instruments and Y after removing this edge. Because they're going to have this directed path from W to Y that does include X. Okay, so, so the outcome is when I, gonna, when I give about al that algorithm a set of instrument or a set of cause effects, so this 
gives you a set of candidate cause effects. If they disagree, the explanation is the existence of a rogue latent variable that is part of your choke set. Okay. Now, if what the set gives you by the end of the day might be a solution that doesn't include any correct cause effect. If there is no valid set of IVs in your system, the set that you get is all wrong possible cause effects. Now, it's just shown that there is at least one genuine pair of cause effects instead of the majority. Then one of them is going to, this particular set will be identified by the algorithm. So the set that you're given the end will include the correct cause effect among spurious ones. So what this gives you by the end of the day is if you look at the set, look at the minimum value on it and the maximum value of it, this gives you a bound on the cause effect. Okay? If, this, if there is no spurious IV instrument of variables in your system, all values are going to collapse to the same value then your bound collapse to a point in that case, but cannot do any better than that using that right constraints. Okay? Of course, you might get creative here and add some other ways by which you can try to identify the cause effect from that set, whether this is justifiable or not. Well, it depends on the domain. But I've seen other papers where people try to, for example, justify that you don't need to have the majority, you just need to find which set of which effect is the most common among all of your effects, and then for some reason claim that it is the correct cause effect, although this is not very justifiable for me. Okay, I'm not recommending much creativity on trying to strengthen these assumptions here. This is what you get. If you, if you are unlucky, you might get a very wide bound. If you are lucky, you might get a very tight one, but you have to live with it. Okay. Now, one way of trying to reduce the size of the set to eliminate some extra spurious uh, candidate cause effects is to, again, exploit non-Gaussian assumptions. Now, part of the work that I did is um, show, she used this to show that you can generalize this previous result by Anton et al., which assumed this partial ordering, and carry this over to the instrumental case. So in the instrumental case, uh, you don't assume anymore that you have an ordering among your set of covariates. You don't know what the ordering of set of covariates is. So you cannot directly assume, cannot directly use the results of internet all, which would require this full partial ordering. Because you're not applying this to the treatment outcome anymore. You're going to apply this to your set of covariates. So if you want to know whether W is a valid instrument or not, okay, instead of assuming whether X is, has no measure confound or not, I'm going to, for example, regress W on the remaining conditioning, on the conditioning set, and then look for its residual. So regressing one covariate on another covariate, and in this case, you don't know the cause of ordering, so you need to generalize the previous results by entering at all. Now, it's still not enough. Of course, this reduces your set of possibilities because you can discard some situations like this. Oops, what did I do here? Yeah. You can discard some situations like this. You will know that W is not an instrument because W and Y will have correlated, will have dependent residuals. So this could be discarded as invalid IVs. But on the other hand, uh, this will discard also some valid IVs if you apply this criteria. So there'll be this trade-off there where you reduce the number of false positives, but you also reduce the number of true positives in your system. So in a situation like this, W and W do have valid IVs, but because of this path, uh, the, the residuals of the regression of W and Y will be dependent. So this would also be discarded even though this is a valid pair of instrumental variables. Okay? 
Uh, of course, what you need here in order to preserve the ability of, of finding these instrumental values is that, the, ironically, the back doors between them and the treatment are blocked. So instead of having the so you essentially need the backdoor criteria again if you want to use this criteria, but the backdoor criteria has to be between the instruments and the treatment instead of the treatment and the outcome. Okay. So I zoom one way by which the two criteria interact here is in this particular result. Now this is work in progress. I have empirical results on simulations and they are fairly decent for large sample sizes. I'm still working on practical applications of it. Uh, one difficulty here is, I actually was discussing this with Cohen yesterday, is how to improve the power of this test. Because that currently, the way I'm doing it right now, it has essentially zero power. But Cohen already gave me some interesting ideas on how to improve on it. So hopefully, once I get this fixed, I'll put the whole set um, of experiments in a submission. There's a current report or writing archive describing and they stand the, the current results of this. I have a much improved manuscript that I'm going to upload soon. But the, the take home message I want to give you this uh, at this point is the practical implementation of this algorithm, uh, first it doesn't use tests of tetrad constraints because this is just gives you lots of errors. It's, it's going to use a different method which I don't have time to describe but you can still make it work in practice uh, by making some extra assumptions on the minimum number of variables that you need. But this is a story I'm not going to get into detail here. You will get better results than other current state of the art because you don't really have the majority rule holding methods like that one I described before will not really work well here. Okay. Uh, but I'm very happy to discuss further empirical results of this. I just want to you to know that there's all these machinery instrumental variables in which you don't need to find a full graph in order to be able some, to say something about the cause effect. And if you have already this very well-defined question you want to answer, it'll be much easier to try to answer that directly instead of trying to reconstruct all connections in that model. All right? So I think I have about, what, <laughs> 10 minutes? OK, I just want to give a general idea of what you can do in the nonlinear discrete case. Here, you cannot have tetrad constraints because those depend on linearity assumptions. So what you're going to do here, again, is estimating directly a particular quantity, a particular cause effect. In the binary case, this cause effect is going to boil down to this. OK, so the changing expectation of the outcome when you vary the treatment from 0 to 1. This is a standard average cause effect in the binary case. Now, one thing that you can do to find that without having to reconstruct a full graph is something akin to find the minimal conditions for which set would work as a, a backdoor adjustment set. Okay. Similar to the case that he had before, that I mentioned before in the linear non-Gaussian situation, there are ways by which you can just say, this set is enough to block back doors between X and Y without having to reconstruct everything. Now, I want to give a spin on that because I don't, uh, I want to allow for possibilities of violations of faithfulness. So instead of saying, using these particular signatures to say this set will block backdoors, I want to be able to claim instead some pathways will be weak, some pathways will be unconstrained. And from that derive bounds on a cause effect. So how would this tie up to the story I told you before? Well, uh, let me jump to this. So there's another related work done by the same people who did the linear on Gaussian case backdoor uh, discovery that use independence constraints. So the idea if you have the treatment outcome X and Y, you might find some extra variable W, which 
can be used to prove that some set Z blocks the back doors. Okay? You find some W which can be used to show Z is a valid adjustment set for the backdoor criteria. It's just using dependence constraints. You can actually see this as a special case of the PC algorithm. Now, okay, one way of seeing this is looking at the opposite implication. So you might actually interpret this in the opposite direction. Instead of W justifying Z as a backdoor adjustment set, you can look at Z as justifying that W as a conditional instrumental variable. So you can have this type of duality between these two elements, W and Z. So instead of claiming I'm going to use the backdoor adjustment with Z, you can claim I could use the instrumental variable method with W. Of course, you wouldn't do this because it's silly, because Z itself already uh, blocks the backdoor. So why would you do that? So without getting into much detail, what I'm going to say is if you find this situation being satisfied, don't throw away any edges. Assume that there is some mild violation of faithfulness there. Assume that you have a situation where there will be possibly hidden common causes between X and Y, but they can also be too strong on X and Y. There will be possible directed paths from W into Y, but it cannot be a very strong path between W and Y. Okay? Now, the, the game is to be able to say, what, what do I mean by weak edge in this case? What's the implication of that? So one way of understanding what it is, is in the parameterization of this model, the conditional distributions for Y and for W will impose some bounds on how strong the interaction with U might be, or how strong the interaction between Y and W might be. So once you have these particular constraints on the strength, we can actually use W as if it was an instrumental variable, condition on C. And the idea is just a generalization of some very well-known results in the instrumental variable literature. So how many of you have seen the idea of bounding a binary effect using an instrument? I don't know if many of you have seen this. Now, without getting into details, the idea is the following. If you have the condition distribution of this treatment outcome pairs given the instrument, you can find some upper bound as a function of that. So if you estimate this distribution, you can just plug in this function, use your upper bound. If you estimate the distribution, plug in a different function, you can have a lower bound. Okay? Now you might think, well, do I need this if I find some independences between W and Y given X? If I use something like the PC algorithm that finds Is a PC algorithm that finds that W and Y are independent given X. Do I need to worry about instruments? Because this would imply it is a Markov chain. There is no confounding between X and Y. Now, if you use these bounds under this situation here, with doubt assuming faithfulness, you'll see this, these bounds can actually be very large. So you can actually show that the, the difference between the upper bound and the lower bound can be quite large depending on how strong W and X are associated. Yes? Well, why, why would you need even new instrumental variables if you have detectively no confounding between X and Y? Oh, but not assume there's no confounding. I'm just assuming that this is independence, but confounding is allowed. Because of what on faithfulness? Yes. OK, so this is, doesn't assume faithfulness. I use these standard textbook bounds, <coughs> imposing this extra constraint on the, the joint distribution. Mm -hmm. And it's very simple to show this is a the difference between the upper bound and the lower bound. So it's quite intuitive in the sense that if W was W and X were deterministic related, this would collapse to zero. Join independent, this would explode to one. Okay? This is of course just a worst case scenario type of analysis. This is just means that there exists a distribution that achieves the other upper bound, and there exists a distribution that achieves the lower bound. But in, that doesn't mean they are likely distributions depending what you think is a plausible distribution or not. Okay, so this was the motivation for relaxing the faithfulness assumptions. 
based on rules motivated by faithfulness. Okay. So by the end of the day, uh, what you get, um, let's see here. This is just a high level idea. Again, the paper described this in much more detail. You just parameterize a full model where everything's connected to everything. Okay. Uh, this model will include the contingent stable for X, Y, W, and Z. This model includes redundant parameters, the distribution of Y when intervene on X. Because there, is, there are redundant parameters, they cannot be completely independent of each other. So the way that Y responds to interventions on X are still going to be constrained by your observation distribution. So that's how you are able to rule out some distributions and get bounds on the effect of X on Y. The outcome of such procedure in the implementation I had this, what I have done with Robin Evans is essentially uh, putting priors of a constrained distribution between all of these variables, getting the bounds out of posteriors on the parameters of this distribution. So if there is uncertainty in the conditions table, this uncertainty is translated on uncertainty on the bounds of the cause effect. So we could have, as the outcome of this procedure, for instance, based on posture distributions on the upper bound, based on posture distributions on the lower bound of the cause effect. Now, one thing you might think about is why do I do this instead of just parameterizing latent variable model? Because I could start from here, treating you as a latent variable model. This would be a standard dagger of latent variables, put priors on a contingent stable, turn the crank of Bayesian inference, get actual point estimates of the cause effect. But the thing is, this little fellow here, when I make it the cause effects on identifiable, if you have a posterior, this, if you have a prior distribution, there'll be still a posterior there. That doesn't mean you should trust the results of this basic inference because they're highly dependent on the prior. <laughs> so if you do a direct modeling of the latent variable model, you might find yourself in this embarrassing situation like this. This is. <laughs> Let's not close this now. This is a synthetic experiment just to show that you should care about not modeling the latent variable directly. So this is with synthetic data, one with training points, just changing the prior and comparing what the latent variable model gives to you and what a bounding approach gives to you. So I, can, I don't know if you can see these gray lines. These are the bounds that the procedure can find find without modeling the latent variable explicitly. This, this distribution here is the implied prior distribution of the cause effect. The other distribution here is the implied posterior on the cause effect. The data is the same, one with them train points, one with them change as the prior. So between the bounds, the data does cannot tell you anything. So whatever happens between the bounds is totally up to the prior. So here is a very, com very complicated posterior because the Markov chain that I used for this was a conversion. Um, in high, when I have stronger priors, it makes the conversions easier, but you can see that whatever happens in between the bounds will be no change, even though the data remains the same, and then the data is very large. It's because the priors. Okay. The likelihood of function is flat here. So just throwing a latent variable model there wouldn't help you. You do need to essentially model what the data can tell you. And what the data can tell you are these constraints that are a result uh, of weakening some of the edges. OK? Now, there's a whole story of how to weaken the, these edges. I'm not going to get in much detail here. Uh, one of the reasons why I previously OK, I guess I have to close the PDF reader. <laughs> One of the reasons why I mentioned at the beginning that sensitivity analysis might be an interesting discussion point is because there is another degree of freedom by which you can weaken these edges. And this is not totally data-driven. Okay, 
I'm very happy to discuss this later today or by email. But the, the paper itself that you already published on these results at JMLR, it tells yet another big story on how possibly we can possibly try to say how much we can should put in these edges instead of setting them to zero. Okay. Now, actually, I wanted to show one final slide. So this is essentially the main take-home message I want to tell you. I just want to say one last thing. So, <laughs> it's a very long story. So John Shaw Taylor from UCLA and I organized a workshop at MIPS. It has a fancy name, but by the end of the day, it's a workshop about causal inference. Okay. So I mean, causal inference in a very general sense. It doesn't need to be just our, our favorite deck based approach for causal inference. It's in a very general sense. So I highly encourage that you submit um, papers to be presented at this workshop. It has very short paper. It doesn't need to be too complicated. Uh, the deadline is very far away. It's October 31st, so there is no excuse. So if you're going to NIPS already in Barcelona, why should you want to go there? I don't know. Uh, you should at the very least drop by, but you can submit something and be very happy to take that into consideration. Okay? So thank you very much for your attention. Uh, questions? So, my limited experience with people who are actually doing this kind of variable analysis who are economists or some of them are so bad, is that uh, their, their problem is a little different from the cis pi problem. That is, they have a cis pi problem with a whole set of games and instruments. But Typically, uh, I find people uh, struggle to find any plausible instruments in their domain. So, you know, what are the plausible? You want to do poverty and education, what are the plausible instruments? You want to do cognitive variables, what are the plausible instruments? And they're, they're desperate to find even one that isn't on its face and plausible. So, uh, I, I haven't read the CIS-5 paper, indeed I didn't even know about it, but do they give any uh, more than one actual example? The examples are based on genetics. There's nothing there about social sciences. So it's say uh, in genetics? I, I see. So I, f I don't quite remember whether there was SNPs or something else, but essentially was the outcome was a phenotype. The treatment was a particular SNP. So it'll be a set of possible SNPs, some of them which don't have a direct effect on the phenotype. So basically not a useful technique for places where you don't know how to identify possible. I have a second question. Um, have you thought about investigating different parameterizations of uh, binary variables uh, in order to find instrument identifier values. For example, if all the connections are noisy OR gates, then the instrument principle works. I don't know about mm -hmm. other parameterizations. Do you? No, I, I know that people have used before s some analogs of the additive modern continuous the continuous case in some instances of discrete cases. So if you know this type of uh, non-Gaussian approach for linear and additive models, there's some related work on that for discrete systems too. I think Kuhn know much better than me. And the same leap, I think, could be made in the case of the instrumental variables. Well, we haven't done this yet, but it is a possibility. Yes? Thanks. So the if I understood you correctly, the condition that you said for um, under which your bounds include the true answer in the continuous case was that you had at least two 
variables which are conditional instruments? Yes, so exactly. Two of the things you measure are instruments conditional on something else mm -hmm. that you measure. Can you um, reconstruct variables to satisfy that condition and so therefore and then guarantee yourself that you satisfy it that way? Because if you have, it sounds to me like that's just the tetrad constraint that we put up earlier where you have W1, W2, calling the Z, mm -hmm. X, and Y. So then if you could take some stuff that you measure and construct a set of variables which now satisfies that tetrad constraint, then you have the guarantee to conditional instruments and the guarantee to balance. So for example, apply some linear transformation to everything, and then no way that you you have those particular tetrad constraints. Yeah. Or 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 some, yeah, maybe that way, or some other way of searching through your big set of variables that you measure for something that satisfies those tetra constraints, and then picking whatever satisfies those, or constructing whatever satisfies those as your instruments. Conditions. Yeah, I'm not sure if the transformation would be. I mean, all it says is if, so there is some assumption at some point that tries to link back the tetra constraints or the rank constraints to structures. So this assumption is not a given. It means it's an assumption. It might be violated. Now, if you artificially try to make the converse work, I'm not sure how much validity that would have. Because the tetra representation theorem, for example, is not a, a, a like faithfulness. It requires some sort of stability on how the parameters are configured. So if you try to do that, I'm not sure how, much, how plausible this converse assumption uh, could be taken seriously. I don't know. Greg? So, um, my understanding is you talked about a Bayesian approach for the discrete but not mm -hmm. for the continuous linear. Have you thought about a Bayesian approach for the form for the continuous linear? Yes, I mean, the problem there is in the, you need a likelihood function. And in most of the cases, the only care, thing you care is a covariance matrix. So you could create a Gaussian model, for example. Then, of course, this would invalidate using the non-Gaussian step of it. You could, could use a linear structure equation model with non-Gaussian errors. It just feels very complicated. I mean, if you look at simple approaches like what CIS-5 does, it's super simple because you're only getting critical covariance matrix. You don't need to worry about the likelihood function. So you can do a Bayesian version of it. It might actually work better than the the evidence that they don't show because I was focused on the population case. But what is our likelihood function for this problem? Sometimes it's like more of Well, when are you going to get this all solved for us? What's that? When are you going to get this all solved for us so we can <laughs> dispense with instrumental variables? Put the Kind of out of business. Anytime soon, or do you think this is going on? It's going to go on for a while. 